your projects are awesome, really creative. Um, I think a lot of you kind of went all out like I, I told you you could, which is really cool. So um, looking forward to reviewing those this weekend to see kind of how they they um, came, um, how they kind of all got finalized. Start thinking about your budgets like we were talking about. It doesn't need to be super detailed, like like really itemized stuff, but just kind of think about those broad categories that we discussed, like, you know, supplies, um, equipment, time, you know, give yourself a stipend or something like that. If it's a monthly stipend or weekly stipend, where you're gonna be staying, travel there, um, just kind of broad um, categories to get to whatever number you're gonna be requesting. Not demonstration is up. Again, there's these pins. Um, that uh, if you want the pins for graduation, just uh, I think these are going into the end of the semester. So um, the the ten knots you need to know are are posted online. You have or posted on Canvas. You have until the end of the semester to do those, and then you could do whatever other ten knots you want for the the pin. The hundred eye natural observations. Hopefully, you guys are getting close with that. You still have to the end of the semester. You can. Um, that assignment's up as well. Um, urban ecosystems, uh, you can, I saw a lot of people tag, were, were tagging um, and posting to the Instagram some of their pitfall traps and sticky traps this past week, which is awesome. Um, keep doing that. It's really, it's really cool to see that. Um, and you guys sharing all your cool ideas. That, that report will be due next week next Friday, and I'll go over that in a little, in a little bit. Um, biodiversity pin challenge, that's up. ESRM photo contest still going. Let me know if you need any more details on that. And then that field methods master pin, which we still haven't got a cool name for yet. If there are any recommendations for the names, please help us out. But we'll do that um, starting in May. So. We're gonna, I'm going to go over veg surveys a little bit. I, I have a few students ask me some good questions this, this past week on you know, things that kind of come up when we're doing veg surveys with quadrats. Um, for, for what you guys are going to be doing, you know, I said three to five um, quadrats minimum, and three would be for a small site. So like for this zone that I have over here, the zone one, it's a really small zone. So if I, you know, you kind of have to use your best judgment on this. And, and the way that I, I'll, what I always ask myself is, you know, okay, I'm gonna do three quadrats here first, right? It's a small zone. You throw your three quadrats out. And once you collect the data, you ask yourself, is this data that I just collected really representing this zone, right? Do I do I feel like you know you want it to be randomized, right? So you want to kind of throw your your quadrats randomly the best that you can, so you're not biasing your samples. But when you do say three, a minimum of three, do you think you got a really good representation of that zone, right? Um, and so if I did three in zone one, I'm pretty confident I would because it takes up most of zone one. I probably, it probably is like 70 or 80% of zone one because it's really small. That might not be the case for my zone two. So, so for these larger zones, I'm going to do five. If you guys want to do more, if you have like a really big zone and you have time and you're really into this, um, go, go for 10. You know, do whatever you want. Um, but, you know, I think what we're going to set it out for is there's going to be a minimum of three for these small zones and a minimum of five for these larger zones. And again, you're just going to have to use your best judgment for that. So this is, this, I just took this um, photo the other day. Um, so my, my zone one is kind of coming to bloom, which is awesome. Um, and so this is really small, right? So if I put my quadrat down, you know, this was one random quadrat that was nicely placed. I have some monkey flower in there. I have my um, evening primroses are kind of going off right now. The bees are loving it. I have this native succulent um, that's from the San Gabriel Mountains that are doing really well. 
And so if I, you know, have a couple of these quadrants in here, I feel like this zone, which is, you know, so like right here, that's kind of like my quadrat is taking up this, right? So if I have three of those quadrats, one, two, three, that's a good chunk of, of that. I might miss one or two species, but that's okay. But right? that's kind of part of the random the randomization. Um, but that's when you have to use your best judgment to kind of see, is are these three quadrants really representing the system well? You also want to start thinking about taking um, percent coverage. And I'd like for you all to, to take percent coverage. Um, that's usually a metric that is, is commonly used in vegetation surveys. Um, and we did this with the, the quadrats that we made right with with the point counts you guys had the the rope that met and and you would you could take a percentage of of you or you could generate a percent coverage um based off of those point counts right you had like 16 points and so you could be like you know there was vegetation in 10 out of the 16 generated percentage so that's an easy way to do it you guys don't have that with these new modified quadrats that you made right so this is where you have to be Kind of an ecologist. We, we do a lot of just kind of general estimations. You should see me when I do fish surveys, right? And you pull a say net up and there's like like a thousand mosquito fish. How do I, I don't count every single mosquito fish, right? I have these estimations and I kind of know there's probably about 10 to 15 mosquito fish that fit in the palm of my hand, right? So I grab them and it's like 10, 20, 30, 40, right? And so that's okay as long as you guys are being consistent with your measurements. And so for this, you try to, you know, kind of come up with, with a, a way that is good for you to, to measure the percent coverage. And so for each quadrat, you're going to identify the species. So I have uh, one, two, three that I can see of monkey flower. Of, I have evening primrose. Um, I forget the name of this succulent. I have it, I have it listed somewhere. Um, but I have like three species here, right? But you know, what, how, what do you think the percent coverage is? Someone yell out some percentages that you think you would, you would classify this, this as. 80%. 80%? 70. 70. Yeah. Everyone I like 80. Can, yeah. I think in between 70 and 80 is, is good. I think that's, that's about right. Right. And so if, it might be different. Everyone's kind of different with theirs, but if you have, you know, you guys are doing your, um, you know, assessment of your backyard, you know, individually, right? So as long as you have kind of a, a similar method that you're using and you're being consistent throughout, then you're going to get a good representation of what every single zone is like, right? And so what would you say the percent cover? This is just to the right of that. I actually have two, so I have an evening primrose coming in here, and then these um, these little buds coming out are milkweed that um, I just planted early in the year. It looks like I have a little like Bermuda grass coming on the edge, but what would you say is the percent coverage of this? About 20. 20 or 30? 20, 30. 15 percent. Like yeah, I'd probably lean more towards 15, you know, so a good way to, that I do these is, you know, split it in half, right? So if I cut this into quarters, I really have like three out of the four quadrants are basically have nothing in them, right? It's had these little guys. And so that already cuts me down to 25%. And then, you know, you have this, which is about half of that quadrant. So let's just say 12% plus these little guys. So yeah, maybe about 15%, 20 at most. Again, everyone's different, but if the if one person's doing all these surveys, so you're doing all the surveys in your backyard and you're consistent with how you're doing your measurements, then you're gonna get a good representation and a good assessment of all your zones. All right. So every quadrant you every quadrant you you take, you're gonna identify um, Every quadrant in each zone, you're gonna you're gonna take a 
you know, the, the IDs of each species. Hopefully you can get them down to genus. I think with iNaturalist, you should all be able to get them down to, to genus level. And, and then get a percent coverage estimate for each one, all right? The, one of the things that makes it a little tricky is when you have these like large, like trees or shrubs and you can't actually get the, the quadrant, uh, quadrant flat, right? So I had some questions about this this week, which is which is really good to cover. So this is where you kind of have to use your best judgment too, and you can do a couple of things. You can kind of imagine if some of us, you know, like I've learned to kind of just think of these in a in a two D space. So you could you could just kind of lift it up and and kind of just envision looking down at this quadrant and what you would see. So yeah, you you probably get this this piece of the trunk and the and the root above. So you count the tree there. I have some ceanothus here, some some of this Bermuda grass, or whatever species of this grass is that I'm trying to get rid of and it keeps coming back. Um, so you could do it this way, or this is what's good a lot of times with the PVC is you can break it in half. And this is why we do like this L shape. So that way you can get it more on a plane. And then, you know, I kind of just make this this invisible line, right? So you can just like trace it. If you're in dirt or sand or whatever, it's easy to kind of trace and just make your a line. Um, and so it makes it a little bit easier. It actually does make it a little bit easier to photograph sometimes. So you can do that. You know, it depends on how you um, made your, your quadrat. If you do have areas in your backyard that you have more trees or large shrubs or something like that, you might want to just make a, a, another quadrat or just like this L shape too. So you have, you know, a regular quadrat, um, the half meter quadrat, and then you have like this L shape that you might be able to use. Um, if it's a big shrub, and I think we, you know, we kind of did some of this stuff at Cayugas Creek. Don't be scared to just chuck it on top and whatever it, it falls, you know, it's, you know, just use your best estimate of what's, what's in there, percent coverage. Usually if you're throwing it into like a big shrubby area, you're going to get like a hundred percent coverage or 90% coverage anyways, but just try to, you know, envision it more in a 2D space when it comes to that. One thing that, that does get misrepresented when you're, when you're doing tree surveys is the canopy, right? So you might actually have the canopy of the, this canopy of this tree is pretty expansive and I didn't take a photo of it, but like, what if you have a quadrat that um, falls and you don't get the tree, like say you don't get the trunk or the root, but above there's tons of leaves and tons of canopy, right? How do you represent that? There's a couple of different ways. This was one thing that was bummed that we weren't able to do with this class because we were going to go out we were going to do coast live oak surveys with the RCD um, for that uh, that that um, polyphagus shot hole boar that's been uh, infecting them. And what they do is they do canopy covers, and they use this tool. Um, it's called a densiometer, forest canopy densiometer, which is a very old school way of of doing canopy surveys. And and most most forest um, um, ecologists still use it to this day where it's, it's just a cool mirror, right? And it's kind of concaved. And we use them in new Orleans. Oh, do you? Cool. Yeah. All the time. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I mean, these things are awesome. And, and you, you know, even with all of this cool technological advances, GIS drones, all that stuff, like it, if you go underneath this canopy, most of these field ecologists are still using these densiometers. Um, they have this, this grid system on it, so you can kind of use it as transects or point counts, right? So a lot of times um, they do the same thing that we do with our quadrats, right? Where if we had the string quadrats and we have our points, you would count how many, you know, I think on these, they're usually like 17 or something like that. Um, and you you just count, you know, oh, is, is there a leaf uh, hitting or some vegetation hitting this point? Boom, boom, boom. And you can get some kind of, of um, percent coverage of canopy. We're not going to do that for this um, lab, but that's how you would do um, this kind of analysis, right? So I think for, for your report, 
that's just something that you'll note, right? You, you can note, hey, this zone, you know, has X, Y, and Z species percent coverage, but what's being misrepresented is the tree canopy, which we weren't able to, you know, accurately estimate. Um, but that's just something you should, in every single one of these zones, you should be noting, um, you know, various species that you might have missed, or even if it's, you know, things like, like insects, right? Like if, if there's just a shit ton of butterflies that are cruising around, that's a good note that you should write in your field notes and you should add in your report. And that won't necessarily make it to your analysis for your species richness and, and your percent coverage and all that stuff. But in your little notes se section in the discussion section of your report, you can start to discuss some of these, all right? Any questions on that? So with the data um, that we get with like the percent yield, how do we uh, how do we take that number to represent the coverage of the area we're zoning? Yeah, so you you could just take an, an average you know percent coverage. So for zone one, say you have three, say you have three quadrats, um, you would just and you have a percent coverage for all three of those quadrats, right? Then you could just take an nest, just take an average. You generate a standard deviation. Um, this is um, so. I'm going to have some examples. Um, I'm going to post um, probably by the end of the day. I'll. I'll post a couple tools for you guys to use to do your analysis. One will be uh, um, a diversity index, right? So you'll be able to kind of plug in your species per zone and generate like a Shannon Weiner Simpsons index, which I don't generally use that much, but I think they're just good, good things to learn. Um, I think one of the things that is, is useful and that is the evenness. So you can, this tells you like what the dominant species are in every zone or whatever area you're going to be assessing, um, or if there's any rare species. So that you'll just kind of plug and chug and, and you can use that. But then the percent coverage, you're going to have to do some basic stats on that. And that's just really calculating an average, whether it's three quadrats or five quadrats. You'll have a percent coverage for every zone, average percent coverage for every zone. And then you'll generate like a standard deviation or error bar. Um, so that way, if you can envision, you know, a figure, you could say, well, I have more species in zone one than zone four, blah, blah, blah. But maybe a zone four has more coverage, right? It's like 100% coverage because it's all grass. So it's like one species. Um, but it's all grass, right? So you can start to generate some of these really basic bar graphs and figures to assess this, right? And so we'll, I'll go over that in a little bit, and we'll, we're going to give you some of the tools to analyze all these all these things. You know, insects, the sticky traps, the, the pitfalls, some of the vegetation surveys, density, or the uh, biodiversity, all that stuff, okay? Um, so... With this, this is kind of what I would like for you guys to do vegetation-wise. And some of you I know have started already with vegetation. That's great. Um, but you should, again, do for each zone, you should have three to five quadrats minimum. And so the three quadrats minimum would be for, like, these small zones. And then if you have, like, these really large zones, some of you I know have really large zones, like you're doing some outside, um, like, parks and stuff near you that are really large zones. So you might want to do, you know, you'll want to do a minimum of five. If you want to do a little bit more, awesome. I'll, I'll leave that up to you, your best judgment. You know, identify all plant species um, down to genus. This is going to be your species richness and your, um, or your, yeah, your species richness. You can use iNaturalist. I think using iNaturalist, you should be able to, to get down to genus level. You're going to calculate um, heterogeneity, diversity. So I will give you a tool to do that. All you have to do is kind of plug and chug your your species per zone, and it'll it'll generate. If any of you have have taken Khan's bio yet, it's like the Bean Lab, right? So it's just like a modified Bean Lab where you could, you know, instead of 
of um, you know outside inside. It's just going to be zone one, zone zone two, zone three, zone four, and then you're going to you know put your species in, and it'll it'll uh, generate all these metrics for you. And then you're going to do average coverage, average percent cover. Um, and then I want you to kind of generate a figure and a table for each. So with tables, you know, you're going to have like a list of, you know, which zone might have which species. Those don't necessarily need like bar graphs or figures or anything like that. With things like species richness, you could imagine having kind of like a bar graph, zone one, zone two, zone three, four, and then how many species there are, and then percent coverage variations, things like that. I want you guys to get creative with this. And like we've done the whole class, I don't want to give you the answers and exactly how to do these things. I want to give you the tools that you can use to analyze your backyard in a, in a way that you think is most representative of your backyard. So every one of these sites is different, you know? And so, um, and that, and I'm happy to help. And you know, we'll have another lab next week where we can answer questions once you guys kind of go through this analysis process and try to figure out the best way to do your zones. But I want you to start thinking about this on your own first before we, you know, kind of give you the answers or lead you to the the right answers. Okay. So you I have one more question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, how do you? best represent randomness when throwing the quadrats because i'm throwing it but i still feel like i know where i'm going to throw it and like at least that's one years. yeah i mean that's a common common thing what i do is you know spin around close your eyes spin around once or twice and throw it behind throw it behind you that's that's how i do randomness in the field um i think you kind of do generally know what's in that area but you just don't want to go over and you know like that photo i showed you earlier today this one that's not random that was taken because i wanted you guys to all see my nice flowers that are all blue <laughs> and gray, right but um and i wanted to place it gently down so i didn't crush any of them but you should instead of going and placing them down you know close your eyes it's really easy. Some of the sites that I go to are really windy. So even if you know kind of where you're throwing it, the wind will gust it and it'll, ran it'll drop randomly. But just try to, you know, close your eyes, spin around a little. You could spin it a little bit. I don't know. I think that's all random. You know, you you just don't perfectly place anything on it. And that's kind of the best that we can do right now. I, there are there are different ways that you could do randomization. Like you could create a grid system of of each one of your zones. Um, this kind of like a, a map. Um, I don't think anybody here uses any of the the, the actual um, printed maps anymore for driving. <laughs> but it was on a grid system, right? So you could is like Thomas guy. Thomas guys, yeah. Man. And that's what I learned on. And then and then you could go and it would be. It'd be random, but right? you could like do random number generators and you can find points. I think for this exercise, we don't necessarily have to do that, right? I think just close your eyes, spin and and wherever it lands. You just want to make sure it the whole quadrat lands in the zone. So if, so for instance, with with this, um, if I had a, a quadrat that kind of landed right here, but was was overlapping into the concrete, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to count that. I would I would rethrow. Just you just want to make sure everything is is within 100% of the zone. Is that cool? For can I ask like a question about mine? Okay, sure. <laughs> my zone. Oh, okay. Uh, so for my zone, I have like 100% coverage uh -huh. for you. But how would I get it random for like species richness? So could I just like create um, a grid out of that my zone that I have and then just take random and then label those grids randomly like one, two, three, four, five, six, and then if pull you... those numbers from a hat? You could do, yeah. I mean, there's there's easy random gen, uh, random number generators online too that you could just say, you know, randomly pick a number between one and a hundred and just keep clicking and I'll do that. If you want to do the random number generator and grid system, go for it. That's awesome. But I don't think you need to. I think the randomness of just closing your eyes, 
and throwing or tossing is random for for your species richness, right? And it is random for your percent coverage. A couple, a quick one, just just okay. because uh, Britton was mentioning it. So everybody has a. If you guys have a watch or if you have a, a cell phone with a timer, everybody already has a random number generator. So absolutely, you can download the apps that are helpful. But if you just start your your stopwatch function and look away, and as long as you have it set to the having at least hundredths of a second, you can use that as as one of your random. Yeah. You know, so just hit start and look away for a, a minute or two, or or you know second or two, whatever, and then hit stop. That's that's an easy way to do a random number generator. The other one I'll just add real quick is, um, so when I was in grad school, we had a long discussion about this, and um, and what my colleagues came to is this, this general agreement that sometimes if you guys are writing a formal paper and you say we randomly allocated our, our, our um, plots, I think what, what Brent was just describing, what you guys are describing, those are all totally fine. But sometimes certain reviewers will say, did you really randomize? How did you random? And so sometimes in the yeah. formal sense, randomization is more of what Brenton was talking about, maps and, and, and completely randomized dropping of points. So one way you can address that uh, or, or just sort of short circuit some of those concerns, you could talk about haphazardly arrayed. So haphazard has the same Im implication, um, you know, mentally, but it doesn't trigger those, those statistical legal definitions of what is random and how did, did you absolutely spend, you know, all this time getting it prepped. And so sometimes by just using a slightly different terminology, you can um, short circuit some of the claims and people won't say that you're falsely representing this as random when it when it wasn't but the reality is any of these things are totally fine for what we're talking about yeah that's awesome thanks doctor yeah that's that's great um any other questions on veds before we we move and then move on to um i think yeah dr dr i was going to show some of the stuff that you guys have done over the past week but good do it um with this, I think for, for this week, if you haven't started your veg surveys, you definitely need to start those because there are going to be, you are going to have to, you know, create some basic figures um, and, and tables and things like that for your report. And I just want to show, I know that I posted these before, but um, these are all kind of, I think, good examples of of um, ecological assessments or sometimes the, the technical reports or technical memorandums. I, if you guys think you're gonna be going into the fields of, of like anything field methods oriented, so even if it's private or federal where you're gonna be assessing, you know, habitats or doing ecological assessments, you're gonna have to write reports. Um, and then once you become retired, like, like Don Alley is, most retirees kind of start up their own private <laughs> consulting firm and that you can come up with your own, you know, I can do like Spees and Associates, <laughs> right? Anderson Spees and Associates Ecological Assessments. You could, you know, if, if you guys want, this is really good exercise if you want to go all out to, to produce a document that you could share for interviews if you're going in for... Totally. Oh, yeah. I mean, and um, if you're going to grad school or thinking about applying to grad school, a lot of grad schools will ask for you to um, to submit one or two uh, examples of, of writing. And so if you're going into a field methods type of program, um, you know, they, they might not necessarily want to see like, you know, you can write a really good report on some topic. I would be stoked to see somebody have like uh, an actual report of a project that they did and all the unique ways that you kind of made do during this time of creating quadrats and, totally. and totally. all that stuff. And so um, kind of go all out if you want. It would be awesome if you guys can do your own little graphics or whatever you want, make it your own. But you know, use these as references too on how to structure a technical re um, report, you know, just these are the dates, right? You should have the dates that you're going out to do each one of these, um, you know, uh, assignments that we're doing for this. You should have tables like with all your species, um, you know, maps. You guys have already created a map. You know, you should 
have your cool cool maps, some photos of, of your sites. So these are all things that you've already kind of compiled already, but you should you should start thinking of, of ways to make up your own unique report that you're going to be submitting. This is just a technical memorandum from um, Cardnex, but th this is more simple. But you know, they just have a lot of these basic tables that show, you know, sand hall one, two, three, some of these things that you guys have done for the Cayugas Creek, right? There's maps, always, always maps. And then you have some more detailed ones. This is what RCD does with their, um, their fish surveys. They have a lot of photos um, showing a lot of their, um, I think this one's like what, 18 pages? Yeah, so they do a lot of, um, individual kind of summaries of, of each day or each thing that they do. Um, they have methods. You guys should really, you know, beef up your methods. And for, for you guys, you're going to have to explain a lot of your methods in more detail, right? You're not using a typical transect and a quadra, right? So make sure you guys have a little section where you are describing how you created your, your quadrats, um, how you measured your backyard, um, things like that. Um, always graphs, always tables. So kind of use these to, to get some, to th see this is kind of something that you probably are all going to use for your species, whether it's the insects that you collected or the, the types of plants, right? They just have a general species list and then site one, two, three, four. So you'll have zone one, two, three, four, whether it's present or not. Um, so make sure you're going through this and, um, you know, including any kind of cool photos that you're finding. So this would be a good place to put like photos of your sticky trap locations and your, your pitfalls and all that, um, to generate a really cool report hey, Emily just for this class, but you, you know, can share for many other things. Good. Hey, I couldn't find the, I couldn't find um, the, um, 